Hello family. With all that is happening in the world, we wanted to take a little bit of time and talk about this coronavirus. And just to encourage you not to operate in fear, but to operate in faith. As you stand in faith, I just want to remind you to practice good hygiene, both personal as well as communal. Here's what we're doing at Victory. We continue to pray and intercede for all of our members, our nation, and people around the world that this coronavirus is affecting. And we'll continue to bring you information, pertinent information about what's going on concerning it so that you'll be aware. I know many of you are listening and you're hearing on the news as well, but we'll try to keep you updated. But we're still believing God that, you know, it will not affect any of us, but we're concerned about our families and our communities at large. And also what we continue to do, we use as a practice is to disinfect all of our high trafficking areas with throughout the ministry, using chemicals and cleaning products that will keep us disinfected. And you know, we have some suggestions of things that you can do as well. Now, according to the CDC, they're telling us to wash your hands and to wash your hands multiple times a day. Also, you can use hand sanitizers. That's really good as well. I just want to remind you that if you have to call, you know, you should probably cough with a, a napkin, a handkerchief, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, tissue. And if you don't have one, just make sure you cough with it. your arm like that, maybe. <clears throat> and also remember, people may be a little bit um, uneasy with touching or being around people. I saw that in the airplane. Yeah. Um, and so you might be a person who likes to hug and shake hands. Maybe no one wants to hug and shake hands with you now. <laughs> so don't be offended about it. Okay, just allow them to have that space. And, and and you just continue to do the things that you need to do. And also, last, check on those elderly uh, people that are in our churches just to make sure that they're doing well. We want to encourage you all to continue to pray and to declare the word of God daily over your life and over your family and over our church family. We want you to continue to use the power and the authority that God has given us in his word to resist the devil and command that devil to stand down. You know, God has given us power and authority in his word for us to declare out loud what God has already provided for us. Don't you ever forget what God has already provided for you. You know, we've been declaring the 91st Psalm over our campuses, and I just want to read it to you today in the easy reading version. And it declares that you can go to God most high to hide. You can go to God all powerful for protection. I say of the Lord, you are my place of safety, my fortress, my God, I trust in you. God will save you from hidden dangers and from deadly diseases. You can go to him for protection. He will cover you like a bird spreading its wings over its babies. You can trust him to surround and protect you like a shield. You will have nothing to fear at night and no need to be afraid of enemies' arrows during the day. You will have no fear of diseases that come to you in the dark or terrible sufferings that come at noon. A thousand people may fall dead at your side and 10,000 right beside you, but nothing bad will happen to you. All you have to do is watch and you will see that the wicked are punished. You trust in the Lord for protection. You have made the God most high your place of safety. So nothing bad will happen to you. No diseases will come near your home. He will command his angels to protect you wherever you go. Their hands will catch you so that you will not hit your foot on a rock. You will have power to tread on, trample on lions and poisonous snakes. The Lord says, if someone trusts me, I will save them. I will protect my followers who call to me for help. When my followers call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them when they're in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. I will give my followers long life and show them my power to save. Praise God. Amen, isn't it exciting? You know, I think the last thing that we simply need to do is just make our declaration of faith. Yes. If you would say this after me, 2020, 2020 is my year of freedom. It's my year of freedom. I decree and declare. I decree and declare. There will be no bad news. There will be no bad news. In my house. In my house. 
I decree and declare. I decree and declare. I will not die. I will not die. Before my time. Before my time. I will live. I will live. And declare. And declare. The works of God. The works of God. In the land of the living. In the land of the living. This is. This is. My greatest year. My greatest year. Oh, now rejoice. Hallelujah. And be glad. We deem this year the year of freedom. We must now come to the realization that the physical senses are what holding us back from living the life that God came to give us, which is to be free. We know how to recognize what we are sensing in the natural. We recognize sickness. We recognize disease. We recognize hurt and offenses. We recognize problems. When will the church recognize what Jesus has done? I like what the singer said. He healed my body. He saved me just in time. And I want to what? Praise his name. It ought to make you want to run. It ought to make you want to shout. It ought to make you want to pray. Woo! Glory. It ought to make a sound. Woo! It ought to cause you to want to dance. Because he's already done it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us, and He has anointed us to preach the gospel and to raise up a body of believers to be the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, a church without walls. Our goals are to teach the Word of God so that at any time you can see the Word, hear the Word, and understand the Word of God, you can be converted into that Word you see, hear, and understand. And once we are converted, we can now strengthen the brethren and as witnesses declare with boldness, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Yeah, so long. Bye -bye. I can't hear you say bye -bye. I can't hear you say bye -bye. I just a little bit louder, bye bye. I just a little bit louder, bye bye. I just a little bit louder, bye bye. Hear you say, bye bye. So long, bye bye. I can't hear you so long, bye bye. Goodbye to my pain, goodbye to my pain and my sorrow. So long, so long, bye bye. Doesn't matter what you got in the bank. Don't matter if you know who your parents are. Doesn't matter what happened to you while you was growing up. None of those things matter because God has qualified you. And it's important to have an open heart with that qualification. Do you understand? The enemy is trying to always to disqualify you and not through deception. To providing you a strange voice providing another word other than what God has said about you. He's trying to point to things that will not lead you down the path of what you have a right to. He's trying to lead you by your mistakes and your failures and tell you you're not qualified. That's deception. But the voice of God is trying to lead you. And, and when you know the voice of God, you don't have to listen to the strange voice. You don't have to be tossed to and fro. You don't have to miss out what God has set aside and, and prearranged for you, which is a good life. God has not planned for you to fail. God has set you up to be successful. And the key to that success is, man, we can hear from God and the enemy can't deceive us.
And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a king wearing a magnificent crown. No, Dad, that's not it. Oh, really? L let me try it again. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a powerful, well-trained soldier. No, Dad, you did it again. That's not right. Okay, uh, how about this? And this will be a sign for you. You will find a democratically elected president. What? No. A trendy motivational speaker. No way. A big tech CEO. A movie star. Time traveling cyborg. None of those are right. The shepherds one couldn't find any of those. Okay then, little Miss Know-It-All. What did they find? For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Oh, that's right, a baby. Does that even make sense? A, a baby is totally helpless. Yeah, but if Jesus didn't come as a baby, mm -hmm. then he would have known what it was like to grow up. Ah, oh, but wait. Why did he have to grow up? That's easy. To save us. Ah, well then that means that the best part about Christmas is... The baby. Right, the baby. Oh, well, I guess it's time you get some sleep. We got a big day ahead of us tomorrow. No, we're not done with the story. Okay, just a little longer. And suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with Welcome to Victory Christian Ministries International, a place where the Word of God and the power of God are available for you with Apostles Tony and Cynthia Brazelton. Victory starts now. And so, look, these group of people on stage, you know, look, they are full of the Word of God. They love Jesus. They have a relationship with them. And so there will be a couple of different things that as we're sharing throughout the night, we'll be discussing different things, and they're going to be have, engaging in that discussion. And so, look, I want you to just have your expectation to hear whatever is coming out of their mouth, to grab a hold of it. I believe each one of them will have an opportunity to say something that you could grab a hold of, a nugget you could take home with you. And so just open up yourselves to what God will speak to you tonight. Look, this series that we're starting is called Better. And really, I want to just get down to the fundamentals of how doing life with God makes us better. You know, sometimes you got to just take those few moments just to step back and say, hey, you know, why am I in this game? You know, why God? Why Christianity? You know, why did I give my life to the Lord in the first place? Sometimes you got to remind yourself of those things, especially when you're getting in challenging situations and things of that nature. And so I really want to start today with talking about how doing life with God makes us better. So I want you all to say this with me. Say, my life is better with God. Life is it's better with God. So I'm just going to have a little seat. And I want to just start off with just, just sharing a little bit how, you know, we were created to do life with God. And, and it's so important that we just be so aware of that. And, you know, I forgot. I wanted to stop. 
stop myself. I know I didn't tell you guys this, but I wanted to, just before I jump into the nuggets of what I'm going to share tonight, I want to just throw it to everyone on my team just to share, like, how many years you've been here at VCMI and maybe one thing you love about <laughs> being here, being part of our family. <laughs> y'all, y'all can't hear me. There we go. Okay, 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 they okay, work. Okay. Let them work out the mics. <laughs> so, again, my name is David Lawrence. I've been here since I was a freshman in high school. I am now in college. Um, one of the things that I love about VCMI is the newness. Every every series, every day is something new. And so who would think, and I was even talking about it last night, who would think that we would ever talk about fellowship? Like you preaching about fellowship, and that's something that's new, that's something that's revelatory. And I think that when you're in a place that is always at the heartbeat of God, always on the timeline with God, I think that always brings a freshness. So that's what I love about VCMI. Yes, good. <laughs> And what I love about VCMI is the word, I mean, is rich. Um, you can just sit at that table and eat, but not only eat, but share. So that practical word, like that, the word comes in such a simplicity that no matter what your age is, that you can really get it, grasp it, understand it, and then go and just share it with someone else. So that's why I really love about it. How many people can relate to that? Give some good word. <laughs> yes. Testing. Okay. I've been here, um, we're going on six years now. My wife and I have been here. And, um, uh, but even how we got connected with the ministry just has been a tremendous blessing um, through serving with the Barboros and being connected. But um, two things that I enjoy is the, the word here is the teaching, but it also challenges you. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like even when the teaching comes forth from the, it, 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 it's more it's contagious. Like you, you got to go home and try to see where can you apply this word into your life. And then uh, part two is that is that the passion for the word of God that our apostles have. I'm telling you, man, it's like, not only that they preach the word, they, but they want that reality to become true in your life. And so that really caught hold of my wife and I when we connected with this ministry. And we was like, listen, we ain't going nowhere else. This is where we're going to be. You know, this is what we needed for our marriage. And our marriage has been just blossoming since we've been here. Our children life. I mean, everything has been changing. So yeah, it, it's, it's great to be in the kingdom of God. Amen. Yeah, it's <laughs> so good. started in the Suitland location, so we were there for seven years, and we relocated to Virginia. We've been in the Virginia location for a year and a half. Um, what I love about VCMI is um, ditto a lot of what they said as far as the word from jump when we were trying to decide whether we wanted to join Victory. I was kind of taken aback by the size of the church, um, but every week the word was exactly what God speaking to me. It was like I would pray a prayer, and then I'd come to church and get exactly the answer that I was looking for. And it was just like, I couldn't ignore that fact. And then, um, this is the first church, that I, my husband's been in the military our entire marriage, so I've been about three years at every church we've been a part of, and this is the first church I had to stay longer than three years. <laughs> I love, I, I'm grateful to God that this is where he decided to keep us because I'm surrounded by people that show me that there's more I can get out of God. I, I haven't reached all that I can reach because there's people all around me that I'm like, wow, look at, wow, <laughs> wow. Like they keep showing me God in whole new ways. And it's just, it keeps me hungry. That's what I love. The yeah. people around me keep me hungry for God. And I love it. That's so good. And I know each and every one of us want to be one of those people that people will say that about your life too, that, hey, you just keep me hungry. You know, like when I get around you, I just get hungry for more God. I want to discover more about him. And so that's what, that is our prayer that you will even discover even through these next couple of weeks as we're entering into this Bible study. That it will be just a hunger that will arise in you to know more of God. And so tonight, again, I was saying, we were just talking about how doing life with God, how it makes us better. And, you know, something that we have to look back just in the very beginning, how God created us to do life with him and how he saw fit that we would be a part of his picture. And, you know, like, it's one of the things I felt like God has spoken to me a lot about is just this area of even how he created us in the beginning. And it really speaks so much to the heartbeat of how God felt about us and even why he wanted us here. And so I want to just take a few moments in the beginning just to share this vision that God has shared with me a couple of years ago about when he decided to create us. 
And so if you never heard this story before, I know I've shared it lots of times. Or if you had, you know, listen in intently. If you need to close your eyes and get a visual, however it is you, you need to see it. But I really just want you to take some time to picture what it is that I'm going to share in this story. And so I was spending time with God in worship, and all of a sudden, he begins to show me this picture of creation. And so I begin to see God and Jesus and Holy Spirit. And here they were in the beginning before anything ever existed in the world, and they were just enjoying each other's company. They were fellowshipping with each other like we were much like we were doing tonight. And then all of a sudden, God decided that he wants to create. And so, of course, we know as we read through Genesis chapter 1 that God begins to speak all of these different things into existence. And so he speaks light being there's light and trees being there's trees and animals. And he's speaking all these different things into existence. But then when it comes time to make you and I, that he does something very different. That he just doesn't say, you know, man being poof, you know, man becomes a living being and walking the earth. But no, it talks about how God gets down in the dirt and literally takes his time in molding and shaping out everything about him. And so here I saw God in the beginning. He was like down in the dirt and he was like completely lost in creating this man. And so he was literally forming and molding out every detail of his body, like how air would flow through his lungs and how blood would pump through his veins and just the little things like how fingernails would grow out of his fingertips and hair out his head. And he was like completely giving himself over to the creation of this man. And it was like here he was like doing everything to make him the best because it was get ready to house himself. You know, I think about this, um, just the character of Iron Man and how, you know, if you know Tony Stark in the movie, he builds this suit that he's going to get inside of. And so when he's building this suit, he's like going to make it the fastest and the strongest and the most powerful. Why? Because he has to wear it and then go out to battle with it. Well, here was God in the beginning literally molding mankind, something he was going to put himself inside. And so he was making us the best, (laughs) in the best way possible, like highly intelligent beings with all of his abilities. Here was God in the beginning doing just that. And so all of a sudden in this vision, I see after he finished molding Adam's body, he literally lifts him up. And right before he breathes life into him, I see God look at Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And they have this great look of anticipation on their faces of what was about to take place. It was like their whole hearts were like, (gasps) like they just knew everything that was going to come about as a result of mankind coming alive. And that just speaks, you know, volumes of God's heart towards us because we all know by the story, God makes Adam, Adam sins and screws up everything he just makes in just a short amount of time. And then, of course, all the ripple effects of sin that we see in the world today. But here was God in the very beginning still choosing us, that he still wanted us. He still was excited about us being here. And so we have to think about God, like, why did you want to do life with us? Like, God, why did you desire us? And when he breathed life on us in the very beginning, like, what did that really enable us to do? And so the first question that I really want to just throw out to you to think about as a congregation is that when God breathed life into mankind, and look, just like he breathed life into Adam in the very beginning, he still does the same thing as, as, as woman takes conception in her womb. Every time God is breathing life into us, And so let's think about when God breathed life on the inside of us, what did that really enable man to do? You know, we got to think about this wasn't just like such a casual experience. (laughs) But like when we really think about like, man, with, with God breathing himself, depositing himself on the inside of us, like what did that do for us? And so this is the first question I really want to just throw out to my team here. And anybody, y'all are free to jump in however you want. But just what, is that, what, is, what did that enable us to do as mankind by having God breathe on the inside of us? Okay, I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> um, just thinking about that question, when God breathed himself into us, it, I, I thought back to the sermon that Pastor Sony was preaching about letting go of our small self so we could be in our bigger self. And, and part of that is being able to see from God's perspective, being able to see with his eyes and 
because Jesus allowed us to come back into that intimate relationship with God, we can really draw close enough to him so that no matter what we're seeing in the natural, we can, t we can really see beyond that natural place and see from God's perspective. It's like God is, no matter what's in front of you, God is always whispering, there's more to this story. If you would just look <laughs> a little bit deeper, if mm -hmm. you would just reach, reach way down on the inside of you because he knows he's there, he's deposited on the inside of us, if we'll open ourselves up to the God perspective. So just the fact that he put himself on the inside of me, I'm able to see more than just what this world has given me in, my, in the natural. I can see beyond that. That's why I can confidently say all things work together for my good because no matter what the situation is, if I can see it from God's perspective, I can see that it's gonna be good when it's all <laughs> over and when it's all said and done. So again, I, I think he enables me to see from his perspective. Yes, that's good. <laughs> things that I was really meditating on this question and one of the things that the Lord told me was impossibilities mm -hmm. I think that when you begin to understand who God calls you to be you begin to push into this realm of I want to do the impossible and as I began to realize that the more I step into the impossibilities beginning to walk by faith I begin to see him more mm -hmm. um, one of the things that he brought to my heart was he talks about the apostle Paul talks about the law and how the law was the tutor before the spirit came. And so you see that the maturity of a Christian is seen not when they follow laws, but when they follow the spirit. That's why the Bible says the sons of God are led by the spirit of God. Mm. And so I can even translate that into my worship life. When I first began to worship, I would just sing a song and it would just, I just began to sing and I love you, Lord. But then as I began to mature in the Lord, when I sing, I become almost vulnerable. I felt like a little kid because I knew I was standing before somebody. So when I began to grow in the Lord, I began to see he called me to do the impossible, mm -hmm. but I also became more aware of his personhood, not his ways. I became more involved in his character. That's why it's important, uh, Lord, you know, that's why in the Bible says you must believe that he is. It's not <laughs> enough for me to just to stand there, just, oh, I just believe, I just believe, I just believe but he's actually inviting me to believe in his character. But then he doesn't just say that, he says, and he is a rewarder for those who diligently seek him. So a lot of times we stop at that scripture, but the and means it's, it's both things working together. It's just, it's me paying attention to his character. He's a good father, he's a provider, he's a healer. But then I'm, that's connected to, he is a rewarder because I seek him. I diligently seek him. So it just brought me to this place of, my God, anything is possible. So I do some <laughs> crazy stuff, you know, just crazy stuff. So that's what. That's good. Possibilities. <laughs> oh, I'm used to this. Okay. <laughs> but um, one thing I want to um, just elaborate on, even when I be begin to uh, walk with God and um, share with me is that I didn't have to be ashamed of my weaknesses. You know, it's one thing that um, when you're trying to live this life and you're not living for putting that super on that natural um, and, and allowing the power of God to be present in your life, you know, I think that when he, when I know that when he came into my life, he enabled me to realize that I don't live from that place of shame, mm. that guilt, that conviction anymore, but you live from that place of truth. And, and, and our apostles always share with us that we gotta discover what God knows and what God believes about us. And so I, I thank God that when, I just, when he enabled that and gave me that ability to see yeah. what he sees about me, that I didn't have to live from that place of shame or conviction. And I believe that helped me to mature in the things of God. Because um, one of the things that I struggled um, when I was, when I, the church that I fellowship with when I was growing up, um, we, we would go to church and have Bible study and things like that. But um, once you got saved, no one able, it was that discipleship that we missed. You know, and so I thank God that um, when he enabled me to mature in the word of God, and uh, I can begin to see that it wasn't the shame, but it was the truth that he enabled me to see that empowered me to walk out the will of God for my life. Yeah. yeah so. You know, you know, it's in the natural when you have children, you know, there's qualities that both you and your child possess, you know. And, you know, people always, it doesn't matter. It just never gets old. People try to pick, oh, he got your nose. Oh, she got your lips. Oh, you know, like, even when you grow, you know, people still be like, oh, you look just like your mom. Well, you look just like your dad. You know, like, it's the nature of a thing that, you know, when you give birth to something, when you breathe life on part of your life-giving sources in them, they bear your qualities. 
And even beyond just those natural qualities, you're like, man, she talked just like you. He walked like you. They have a personality like you. They're funny like you. They're silly like you. And so, like, here was God in the beginning breathing life in, into us. And so there were qualities that was exchanged among us that we get to bear like God. And so when you think about, like, what qualities do we, us and God both possess? His grace. <laughs> I think that we, we speak about his grace and mercy so much. Like, oh, well, God is so gracious. But no, we are so gracious. We are so merciful. We are so loving. And I think that's one thing that we have to grow in the body of Christ because we speak of his attributes, but we possess those same attributes, those same very being of God, his very DNA, that we are gracious to others. We are loving. We, we, we carry the joy of the Lord on the inside of us wherever we go. You know, we carry the presence of God with us. And so I think that those characters, well, I know that those characters, we have to uh, um, take possession of those and know that they dwell within us, that we don't have to sing of it or, or, or talk about it or preach of it from a third person point of view, but we, we experience that in our everyday life. Yeah. <laughs> so good. <laughs> so look, the scripture that we're looking at, just so y'all have this reference, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. And it says, so look, God created humans in his own image. It says he created them to be like himself. And that can never get old to us. Look, God created you to be like himself. Let's all say, God created me to be like him. It's so true. And it says, look, and he created them both male and female. Nobody was left out of this equation, whether you're a man or a woman, child or adult. We were all created to be like God. God. And it's so good. You know, he could have made us like little robots to just do whatever he wanted. He could have made us as like very special pets, you know what I'm saying, where he just played with us and sent us on our way. But he made us in the same class of being as himself so that he could have real relationship with us, that he could talk to us and that we could partner with him in life. And here's what God is looking for us, a partnership in life with. That he says, look, it's better to do life with me. And he decided that from the very beginning. So here's the activity I want everybody to do. If you got cell phone, tablets, whatever you're taking notes on, or if you got a piece of paper, pen, pull that out <laughs> at this time. But I want everybody in the room, I want you to take some time to write down at least three things that being made like God has enabled you to do. And, you know, there might be different qualities of God that stand out to you more than others. But I just want you just to pick three things that being made like God has enabled you to do. And they've shared a few of them here tonight already of being able to see like God, to bear his character, to, you know, to do be limitless, <laughs> to do the supernatural. Some of my answers was to be creative, to be fruitful. To multiply. <laughs> He's enabled me to have authority, to have power. Whatever speaks to you, whatever God is whispering in your ear, I want you to just write down for yourself three things that God has enabled you to do. put this in your ear gates one of the things that about that scripture said uh, he created them to be like himself one of the things is that I remember when I was when the Lord would convict me of certain things I would shame myself I would condemn myself and the Lord began to tell me you, he would say son I need you to stop hating yourself when I convict you because then I have to it's almost like you stop the conviction or you stop him trying to talk to you because of yourself, hey, I did this, so I'm so stupid, so you will shame yourself. And so one of the things that the Lord began to share with me is that repentance brings you into his image. See, God never re makes you repent, or God doesn't call us to repent just so that you can be good. No, he calls you to repent so you can be like him, because he is the standard by which we live by. So when he convicts you of something, that repentance makes you like him. That repentance causes you to love like him, be kind like him, think no evil like him. So every time I begin to fall in love with his convictions, mm -hmm. you know, I, oh God, you, you don't like me doing that? God, okay, I won't do it no more. Why? Because I want to be like you. And so I know the ways that he does it is through convictions. 
So just put that in your ear gate. Like, what are things, if, if selfishness is not like him? So he convicts you of selfishness so that you can be selfless like him. You know, if you're rude, he convicts you of rudeness <laughs> so you can be kind like him. So it always brings you into the image of who he is. So just those two for fun. And that's so good. So whenever you find your place out of alignment of his character or out of these qualities that you know God possesses, whenever you repent, it just lines you right back up. <laughs> lines you right back up. All right, so y'all got your three things written down. Okay, I want you to turn to one other person, and I want you to share what those three things are. Just find what other person you sit next to and just share what those three things you wrote down. <laughs> I will give you our 30 more seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all had some good things written down. Yeah, so good things to share. And, you know, sometimes it's good to write down things like this because sometimes you got to remind yourself. <laughs> you know, I got power when you feel weak or you feel like you're troubled or you ain't got no power. You sick. Like, no, I'm healed because I'm just like my dad. You know, you got to remind yourself of just those qualities and those things that God has placed on the inside of you. So, look, if you're not done, I'm going to ask you to turn your attention back this way. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it because y'all doing that fellowship. Y'all hold it down. <laughs> you'll have another chance to um, share. But, you know, just like, you know, David was sharing, sometimes it can seem hard to be aware of how much you're like God, especially when you notice your flaws and you know your mistakes and you know the things you've done wrong. You're like, it don't seem like I'm much like God at all. <laughs> you know, like I feel like I got a lot of work to get to that place. Um, and so I have some scriptures to share for that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In verse 21, and it says, for God made Christ, it says, who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. And so here, look, we are only made right because of Jesus. <laughs> you know, like David said, we, when you, the repentance, when you repent of your sins and whatever it is in your life that you notice that's not like God, that God says Jesus Christ makes us right, that he became an offering for our sins. He paid the price for all of our sins. And it's because of Jesus that we get to be made right just like him. The second verse I want to read is 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1. And it says this, as God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of kindness and then ignore it. And I use this scripture because, look, it says it calls you God's partners. And, you know, you don't just partner with anybody, or at least you shouldn't. You know, you're thinking if you're going into business with somebody, you like, you want them to have some good common sense, have some stewardship skills. <laughs> you know, like, if I'm going into partnership in marriage, you got to be, you know, a good man and loyal, you know, and a good family person. There got to be some qualities about yourself that I'm going to partner with you. But here, look, God invites us into partnership with him. Like, how cool is that? God said, hey, look, I'm inviting you to do life with me, to partner with me. And then it says, look, it says, don't ignore this marvelous gift that we get to be partners with God. You could do your whole life and completely ignore the reality that God is there to do life with you. But when you know God is beside you, he's with you every day of your life, ready to partner with you on every adventure of life, anything that could come in your way. Like, when you be aware of that gift, there is an empowerment that comes to you as a result of being aware that God is with you. And so here, 
I want to read this too. In Genesis chapter 2, in verse 19, we begin to see this partnership that God um, shows even in the very beginning with Adam. He expresses this desire for him to partner with you and I. And so it says in verse 19, so the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. And it says, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. Look, if God wanted to, he could have created all the animals and brought them to Adam and said, hey, this is a dog, this is an elephant. You know, God could have told him what everything was. But here he was looking for partnership in the very beginning. So he brings them to Adam and says, hey, you name them. You call it what you want it to be. And God even allows that with our own lives. He says, hey, like, you say what you want things to look like. You declare what you want your bank account to be like. You declare what you want your future to look like. Here is God looking to partner with you and I. Even this past week, you know, I'm the type of person that in my prayers with God often just look like conversations with him. And so I usually don't spend a whole lot of time saying, God, I want this to happen, and God, do this, and confessions, and those things are really good. And, but I'm, just, I'm so used to just talking to him throughout my day. And he stopped me, and I was getting ready to watch a movie, actually. And he says, hey, before you watch, watch that movie, I want to talk to you. I said, okay. He said, I want you to tell me what it is you want in life. And so I'm like, okay. He said, I want you to verbally say it. And he began to remind me of the power of us speaking out those things and making it a verbal prayer before God, how he wanted me to utter it out my mouth. And so here is God looking to partner with us in what he wants to do in this world. So he will come to you and say, hey, open your mouth, declare what you want to see in your community. Declare what you want your family to be like. You know, he's given us the opportunity to partner with him. And look, and throughout the scripture, we see God over and over again where God is looking to partner with mankind, where he pulls on different people like we, like we talked about on Sunday, like Moses and the prophets and Elijah. He pulls on so many different people. Instead of God just sovereignly doing things on our behalf, that he's pulling mankind into this area of partnership where he says, hey, you lift your hands, you open your mouth, you do this act, and you will see these supernatural things take place as a result because God is looking to partner with us. And so the next question I want to put out there is, what are some things that God has invited us to partner with him on? <laughs> so um, some things that he, well, for me, um, I know that he's probably going to be asking us, you know, to partner with him in, you know, family and marriage and children <laughs> You know, and um, so I can say, you know, I, we have a daughter and, um, and you know, it's, you know, we're raising her up in the fear of the Lord. And it's just like, okay, God, how do I take this gift that you've given to me, this ministry um, that you've given and, you know, and take it to where you, you want it to be? So I, I have to listen closely because she does things or she says things. I'm listening intently like, okay, um, I'm hearing um, even through that, like, you know, God speaking through this little person, because um, I call them little people. So through this <laughs> little person, you know, sharing um, about her heart, you know, and I know that God is placing those things on her heart. So I have to, you know, take those words and cultivate those words um, and steer her, you know, in the right direction with that. And so, you know, he wants us to partner uh, with him in this gift that he's, you know, given to us. Um, that have children or, you know, even in your marriage. I, I can't do marriage without God. I cannot mm -hmm. do marriage without him. Mm -hmm. um, I need him, you know, guiding me in this relationship. And not just marriage, but just, you know, a relationship with one another. I need him. I need him speaking to me to share, you know, the sensitivity that David might have and me having conversation with him or, you know, the things that, you know, he might like or whatever to really just have a relationship, a heartfelt God relationship. He wants us to have that with one another. Because when you think about in the beginning, you said that there was, I mean, there, there was God, there was Holy Spirit, and there was Jesus. And so they were fellowshipping with one another. And so when he placed Adam there, he didn't want Adam to be alone. Mm -hmm. He wanted him to be just like him. And so he gave him Eve. And then, you know, and then he kept, you know, multiplying man um, through, um, a reproduction, but he didn't want us to be alone. He wanted us to fellowship and grab hold of one another and just, you know, be together. Yes, yeah. and it's such an awesome privilege for us to be in this place for God to allow us 
the ability to raise people. <laughs> you know, like, you know, I'm sure for those parents, you're like, it don't seem like a privilege all the time. <laughs> you know, especially when they're challenging. But, you know, God could have just had everybody who populated the earth come in as adults. But he gave you the distinct privilege of raising little people to and molding and shaping their identities and who they are. And that's something we get to partner with God on. <laughs> Her daughter speaking, and she's trying to guide, you know, God coming out of her daughter. Just when I was thinking about this question, it, it was just amazing to me that God wants us to be an extension of him. And because God is able to take on so many shapes and forms, because he's able to be whatever we need, whenever we need it. So God coming out of you looks completely different than God coming out of me. Mm -hmm. And that's the power of our different life experiences. That's the power of all of the things that we've been through. The very things that a lot of us may be ashamed of, our ability to minister from those experiences allow us to release God in a way that nobody else can. That's why every person in this world has to be different. Every person has a different assignment. Every person has to be unique because we get to show just how different God is coming out of every last one of us. And God wants us to just simply be an extension of him. That's why this series is so important about us being able to fellowship with one another because every single one of us shows a different version of what God can look like. Because mm -hmm. you can minister based on your experiences <laughs> in a way that I could never minister. And even with our children, they can see things in a different way than I can just simply because they have a level of innocence that I may have lost over the years. So <laughs> it's just learning how to hear and receive God when he's coming through different people. And I, I just love that he even trusts us to partner with him through some of the very things we may even be ashamed of that we've gone through, some of the very experiences we may have been addicted or been through different things that we've had in the past, but it's those experiences that allow us to minister to somebody that's in that place right now. You know, the very things that we've overcome allow us to be an extension of God so that we can reach people in a way that nobody else could. Yeah. So good. <laughs> Just a caveat off of that is... Um, there's no message without him. And, and, and as you were sharing there, I just see the billboard. So if, <laughs> if we do not allow God to in, be the center of every area of our life, and, and that's what he was even sharing with me a couple weeks ago concerning my marriage, my finances, um, my, on the work, the job, everybody I come to the grocery store, he's like, I have to be the center. Because if, if I'm not the center, you always continue to think like you're doing it. And he doesn't want that because that doesn't cause his light to shine. His light shines when we allow our weakness in our weaknesses that he can prove himself strong in our lives. Mm -hmm. And one thing that he did, Curtis, when I was, this was a financial thing that we were going through in our marriage. Um, my daughter, through my child, who I tell you, I, he just made me start to listen to my daughter. She would get in the car and she'd talk about her car. You know, she... And, you know, she'd get, go in the fridge and talk about, eat, eat, daddy, I want to eat. But she's not asking me if there's food in the refrigerator. She's like, eat, eat, I want to eat. She don't know if we, bought, we paid for groceries or anything, but she know, like, you're going to feed me. You know, you, um, even when she come up, she, she's at the school. We go to the school. The teacher's like, yeah. She's talking about she's going to bring her friends to her house, you know. But these are things, and God was just showing me like that. It's like, as a child, think. They got unlimited thinking. You know, I'm provided for them <laughs> the same way as I provide for you. You know what I mean? They're not thinking about how they're going to pay the bill tomorrow. They're not thinking about is there food on the table. They just know it's there. And that's what he required for us to know is to know and to believe that it's already done. And so <laughs> that's the caveat yes. off of what you were saying. <laughs> it's done. <laughs> it's good. Yeah. Um, it was interesting because the Lord was speaking to me about the subject of parenting. And one of the things that God spoke to me about was a couple of thoughts, but one of them in particular he's speaking to me about right now is, he said, son, a lot of people are teaching men or young or their sons how to be men. He said, but one of the most important skills a father can teach a son is how to be a son. Because the one thing that will never change, whether you're on this earth or in that or, or in heaven, is that you will always be a son, you will always be a daughter. Mm -hmm. And then he began to talk to me about the con conversing and how the importance of being able to communicate with your children. And something that my mother really fostered was having open dialogue. You know, sometimes I've seen it, especially in movies or when people, when, you know, I used to talk to my friends and parents be like, shut your mouth, I'm talking, I don't wanna hear nothing you say. Or, you know, it's my house, I got the final say. And so what the Lord says, what they begin to do is they begin to cut off the, the ability for the children to speak. See, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Mm -hmm. So in order for you to identify what is going on in your child's life, you have to give them an opportunity to speak. 
a biblical principle of that is God says, come together and let us reason. And so being able to converse with not only your children, but with your spouse, you begin to open up and see what is it that they really think. Because in those conversations, you can correct doctrine. In those conversations, you can uh, rebuke or exhort or, or begin to amplify those things. So whenever we're dealing with relationships and we begin to cut off communication and even knowing how to talk to your significant other, like for me, in my relationship, I would always figure out, okay, how can we talk? And, and God said, whenever she talks about this movie, like for example, movies, oh, you see what this girl did in that thing, da, 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 and I began to see. That's her way of communicating her doctrine. That's her way of communicating her belief. She might not come out and say, this is what I believe, but she will speak about what she believes by correcting the actions of the actor, by correcting the, the actions of the actress. And in that, I'm able to communicate with her, like, oh, yeah, I don't like that. Mm -mm. The Bible said, Brr. and so I just <laughs> created a conversation around a movie. But if you never <laughs> give your spouse an opportunity to watch a movie, you never get to know their heart. And so uh, that's the importance of being able to understand conversing. How is it that your child communicates? Do you talk to them about school? Do you talk to them about little Susie and little Johnny? Because then you're able to see, uh-uh, you, you, you dealing with a little revenge spirit, you little... No, daughter, no, little Susie. This is how you show love. This is how you show compassion. So, you know, that was one of those things that we do in children's church. <laughs> we talk to the children, we ask them how their day is, how their week's going. And so, it's very important that you bring your children out to BCMI Children's Ministry on Sunday mornings <laughs> and Tuesday nights. Um, so, <laughs> hey, do that get plug. That same teaching, um, we love them. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta put that plug in. Yeah. You know, but that's the, you know, <laughs> the, that's the beautiful thing is that everybody has the opportunity to reveal God. You know, like you said, everybody has God deposited on the, on the inside of them, whether you're two years old or whether you're 72. And so we all have the opportunity to partner with God in revealing his nature, in revealing his character. And, I, you know, we shared this scripture on Sunday about how in, in John chapter 20, how Jesus said that God sent him into the earth to reveal the Father. But then he says, but I also have sent you to do the same thing. And so each of us get to partner with God in being a living letter to reveal who God is. And so some of the things that I wrote down, what are some things that God has invited us to partner with him on? Is look, it's releasing heaven on earth. You know, like whatever we see happening in heaven, there's no sickness there. There's no disease there. There's no poverty there. There's no strife there. And so God says, look, he wants us to release what is happening in heaven and then make that available on earth. And that is something God has invited us to partner with him on. And so when I walk past somebody and they're coughing and they're sick, I can lay hands on them and I see heaven released. Now there's no sickness here. And when there's, there's discouragement, somebody's depressed, hey, there's nobody sad in heaven, I get to now change speak a word of encouragement to change their life. And I get to partner with God to release heaven on earth. I wrote down, look, we get to release healing. We get to release encouragement. And there's so many things that just throughout scripture, God has invited us to partner with him in doing the supernatural. Um, you know, Jesus did so many crazy miracles while he was on the earth. And then he says, look, greater works will we do just because we believe. And so here is God even inviting us to do greater works than he did when he was on the earth. And that always just blows my mind away. Because when you think about, like, Jesus walked on water, he changed the DNA of a drink, he, like, raised somebody from the dead, he opened blind eyes, and then he said we was going to do greater? You know, like, come on, like, we don't want to, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't want to do life average or normal when God says I can do greater things than that. <laughs> like we have so much more in us that we're capable of doing than what many of us have seen. And so let us pursue those things. Let us pursue what it really means to partner with God in this world to release his power and release his supernatural love in this world that we live in. And so, you know, I ask this question too, why is it better to partner with God? I just, I literally heard something the other day that anytime you start anything with God, the end is always going to, anything without God, the end will always be a disappointment. Mm. If you start anything without God, even if you succeed at what you're doing, if you succeed in the natural, it's going to be empty because you try to accomplish it without God. That's why we see so many people that may be rich, but it's empty because they chose to do it without God. There may be people that have a, a, attained all of their career goals, but because they chose to do it without God, there's an emptiness to it. 
God placed himself on the inside of us and he, God desires fellowship. So there's a part of us that always desires to be connected to God. Whether we choose to acknowledge that or not, it's still there because God is always going to be there because he breathed life in us to even get us here in the first place. So when we choose to do anything with God, without God, that we have disappointment. So, I mean, of course we want to partner with God so that we can <laughs> yes. enjoy, enjoy the things that we experience. Yeah. And, and God is always going to fulfill his word, you know, and that's what the scripture declares that, you know, his word will never, you know, return to him void. That anything that, any time that we partner with God is always better to partner with him because it's the fact that the word is going to uphold that very thing <laughs> that, you, that you're believing for, what you're trusting for. So it's always great to, to partner with him. And that's what we're sharing with our, when it comes to our parenting, our finances, it's always best to partner with God because it will be upheld by his word. If you partner with God, you don't need a plan B, you don't need a plan C, <laughs> you just need plan A. And so um, it's just, it, it just turns out so much better before starting anything. If you just position yourself, be like, okay, God, what do you want, what do you want me to do? You know, even down to the smallest things, you know, what earrings should I wear? What shoes, you know, should I wear for the day? You don't know what's going to take place during that day, but God does. And so just partnering with him, it just makes it so much better, so much joyful. It's just so divine. It's exciting um, in, in everything. No, seriously, it is. Like if I'm cooking with God, if I'm dancing with God, if I'm singing with God, you know, it's, it's just so much better. Can I ask a question? Who likes ice cream and cake? <laughs> How many of you heard the saying, like, you can't have your cookies and your ice cream too? <laughs> How many, seriously, you heard that saying before? Here's what, here's what I say. The Lord says... What does it gain a man or what does it profit man to, to gain the world just to lose his soul? The Lord showed me that, you know how we, God, they, they so, they so uh, uh, unrighteous, they unbelievers, but why are you blessing them? You're not blessing me. Well, if you look at that scripture, it's pretty much saying anybody can gain the world. But what does it profit you to lose your soul in the meanwhile of doing it? So what I began to realize was, oh, he wants me, I can have, you know, nice things. I can have money. I can have the nice clothes. I just want to do it with him so that I can have the nice things of this world and still go to heaven. <laughs> so I want my cake and my ice cream too, you know what I'm saying? It's just a natural thing. So what's the point in trying to step outside the obedience of God just to lose it all? What is it value? What is it gain for you? You wake up, you have everything you want, you have your career, you have your success, you have the fame, but you don't know what your child's going through. You don't know what God loves about you. You don't know anything about him. So you did everything in this world. You didn't obey him, you didn't listen to him, but you still got the riches. It's still gonna come, it's a natural thing, because even heathens can do it. But why not get your money and go to heaven at the same time? <laughs> I feel like for me, you know, why is it better, you know, to partner with God? Like, you get to relax. You know, I don't know if you ever just have somebody with you and just like whenever they there, they just take care of everything so you can just like, oh, I'm rested. Look, I have a few friends that like they love, we go on vacation together. And one of my friends, he's just really good at like just picking out all the activities and picking out everything. And so I can go on the trips. I ain't got to worry about where we go, what we doing. Like everything's just already taken care of because they just have it figured out. I get to relax. And like it's like doing life with God is like that. When you're with them, when you just get to enjoy life, you get to go for the ride. Like, God, what we doing today? Like I'm just chilling. Whatever you show me, that's what I got. And it, there's so, it just takes the pressure off of you to try to figure out life on your own when you partner with God because he can lead you and guide you. He gives you wisdom and he gives you power just to, to do anything that you need to do in this world. And so one of the scriptures that I wanted to read is Psalms chapter 37 in verse 5. And in the Passion Translation it says this, give God the right to direct your life. And as you trust him along the way, you'll find he pulled it off perfectly. And that is so true. You know, everybody wants to live life at its best. You know, they be like, YOLO, you know, <laughs> just someone to live it up. And so it's like, how do I live life to the fullest? How do I enjoy the best that I can have for my life is I want to allow God to direct me. I'm going to allow God to partner with me. And when I partner with God in life, I find out, man, like, this, this turned out really good. Like, I don't know if anybody's ever, like, giving you directions on something. You followed it, and you're like, man, this turned out amazing. Like, you know, my grandmother gave me instructions on how to make some sweet potato casserole. And, you know, she's like, add a pinch of this and do it, this and that. And I'm following her to the T. And then I finished the whole thing, bake it, come out. It tastes so good. 
I pulled it off perfectly. Why? Because I had her in my ear. And so here is God wanting to do that with our lives. Like he wants to direct you and lead you, tell you what ingredients you need to put in your macaroni and cheese. He wants to lead you in what you need to do on your job to get that promotion. He wants to give you the instructions on how to raise your children. He wants to do those things and how to have a healthy relationship with your spouse. And so look, when I follow God's directions, I find he pulls it off. And, you know, sometimes we can have it in our own hearts how we want to do things or what, how our life should be or what I should do. You know, well, my mama raised me this way or, you know, their marriage looked like this. And God's like, hey, I don't want you to do what your parents did. I don't want you to go where your friends are going. And when you allow God to direct you, you'll find it will be the absolute best, <laughs> the absolute best. And so there's so many different ways, again, that we can partner with God. And so I have another activity for you guys. So if you got your pens and paper, pull them out again on your tablets, your phones. But I want us to just take a few moments and to think about what is one thing that we can do to partner with God this week. You know, we talked about lots of different ways that we can partner with God and loving others, revealing his character, sharing the word, <laughs> giving. So I want you to just take a few moments just to think of one thing that you can do this week to partner with God. I feel like for some people in the room, God may be whispering something in your ear <laughs> that he's directing you to do. So whatever that is, just write it down. All right, when you got your one thing written down, just wave at me. <laughs> so I know we got so y'all good. <laughs> I get some good instruction. And that's something you can even practice throughout the week. Like, hey, God, when you wake up in the morning, hey, what can I do to partner with you today? You know, it might be something just as simple as, hey, you know, pour, pour your son's cereal for breakfast. <laughs> you know, like, it seems so silly, but God would, you know, whisper things in your ear like, hey, I want to love this person or I want to partner with you in this way. And just every day just looking for opportunities of how we can partner with God in this life. All right, the scripture I want to read is Romans chapter 6, and I'm going to read verse 11 and 14 in the Amplified Version, and it says this, even so, consider yourselves also dead to sin, and your relation to it broken, it says, but alive to God, here's the catch, living in unbroken fellowship with him, in Christ Jesus it says, for sin shall not any longer exert dominion over you since, you, since now you are not under the law as slaves, but under grace, as subjects of God's favor and mercy. Look, in the scripture, it talks about we get to be the objects of God's favor and mercy when we do what? We live a lives of unbroken fellowship with God. It says, when you're in this place, it says, sin has no dominion over you. The effects of sin can't control your life. You no longer have to be enslaved to the things of the world. When I stay in this place of unbroken fellowship with God, of just doing life with him, one of these quotes I wrote down, look, that God has literally planted in your DNA the need for connection with him. That when he breathed life in us in the beginning, he put it as a deposit on the inside of us that we need God. <laughs> and says he knows that apart from him, that our lives will be filled with pain and darkness and so even when we sinned and we separated ourselves from him, he loved us enough to pursue us and to bring us back into relationship with him because he didn't want us to have to do life without him. He knew we would fail at it. He knew we would make mistakes. He knew we would screw things up. And so look, he opened up a free door for us to do life with him by just accepting this free gift of salvation, this free gift of entering into a relationship with him. And in that place, now we get to be, like that scripture said, objects of his favor and objects of his mercy. 
And that's something we can't take for granted. I don't know about anybody's ever been favored in life, you know, where you was at the back of the line and you saw somebody you knew and all of a sudden you got to be at the front or you didn't have no money, but because you was hanging out with your friend, they paid for everything. Like, you know, there's something when God favors you that's unlike anything else. Like he, the way God favors us far exceeds any favor anybody in this world could ever offer you. And so I want to be in God's favor. Hey, I want to live in this place of unbroken fellowship with God. I want to live a life of partnering with him so that I can experience God's favor and experience his mercy even when I make the mistakes. God is so merciful and he's so gracious towards us. And so the question I have on here is, what benefits of doing life with God would you share to someone who might be like afraid of accepting him? You know, there's so many people who have just so many different views of God, and they're like, well, I don't know about this thing. Like, do I have to give up this or give up that? And if I choose to, you know, do life with God, what does that really mean? What does that look like? You know, maybe they have these ideals of it looking spooky or, you know, I don't know what God's going to send me to Africa. You know, I remember that used to be like the big thing. Like, if I choose to give God my life, he's going to send me on the mission field. And, you know, and he might, you know. <laughs> you know, but, you know, what would you say to someone, um, what are, what are some benefits of doing life to God that you would say to someone who maybe needs to be encouraged in that place? Um, one, one day I was in my kitchen and I was making noodles. Oh, no, I wasn't making noodles. I was walking in front of the movies. And the Lord said to me, whenever somebody is trying to get deeper with him, why do they always say, I'm going to go to church more? I'm going to stop drinking, I'm going to stop smoking, I'm going to stop clubbing, I'm going to stop doing all these things. He said, why don't they ever say they want to know me? Because if you read in Philippians, he said, Let's, can, I, can we go there? I, I, just, I just feel bad. I don't want to quote it and not say it accurately. So let me just, where am I here? No, it's the third chapter. Hallelujah. It's the third what? He says, the Apostle Paul is pretty much talking about um, how he's pretty much saying that you shouldn't brag in yourself. Verse 4, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning their law, a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But, that, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted for loss. Yet indeed, I also kind of all things for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, Lord, for whom I suffered the things, of, the loss of all things. So he goes on further, but pretty much what he said was, I counted all these things lost to get to know him. If you put rules and regulations before people, you need to do this and you need to do that, you need to do this. It takes the joy of knowing him because now you have to pretty much serve a person you don't even know through con condemnation, through guilt or through or suffering. So one of the things he was telling me is get to talk to people about me. Don't sit there and tell them you need to stop doing this because they don't know me. What he caught those things lost because he knew him, because he wanted to know him. I, I, don't, I just don't want to do life and just do it. Just I'm not going to do this. I want to know him. I want to partake in the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to press into the high calling of God. But it started from the place of desiring to know him. Who is this man that would die for me? Who is this guy that would, who would love me unconditionally? It's the desire to know him. It's the desire to be in fellowship with him. And so when you put that in somebody's heart, all those other things seem like loss. But you can't tell a person, you know, I, who likes to drink, stop drinking. They, no, you got to give them something that makes them love it more than that desire. And that thing is to know Jesus. Amen. So. I think an extension of that is so many people are trying to correct themselves before they come to God, but to me, the, the benefit, the, the thing I would encourage them with is redemption is there with God. I, I'm taking to the scripture that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. And so many of us are trying to get rid of the old before we even get to God, but you got to get to God so that he can get rid of the, the old for you. We're we're so caught up in what we've done in the past, we allow that to block us from coming to God. But God just wants us to come to him so that he can help to free us from those things. And that, that's where we get our peace from, is in knowing that God is freeing us from all of the things that we feel like are, is holding us back. And even those of us that are already saved, I mean, his mercies are new every morning. 
So no matter how many times I fail, how many times I let him down, God is not judging me. God is always there ready to pick me up. He's always there ready to bring me back to that place with him if I'll just trust him to bring me to, to that place of redemption. So we don't, we don't have to run and hide from God because we feel like our past is disqualifying us. None of us were ever qualified from the jump. But if we would just trust God to take everything that we are and restore us, because all we need is Jesus. Jesus is the, is the, is the way. We just, we just take the grace and walk in it. <laughs> so that's, that's what I would say. Yeah. <laughs> One benefit I have um, is, is the peace of God. I know we come out of a meeting today, and even I'm just coming out smiling. But I, I share that with you because my favorite scripture is Philippians 4 and 6. And, and it shares, you know, that you know, we don't have to be anxious for nothing. You know, but, but through prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, you know, we can always let that request be made known unto God. And it's that peace of God which passes all understanding that keeps our hearts and minds through him. And I'm telling you that that's the benefits that we have with partnering with him when it comes to parenting. When the kids don't want to go to bed at night, you got to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning for work. <laughs> that's the benefit to that, you know. Um, just even the most challenging and difficult times, it's that peace that, that keeps you there knowing that, you know, you could, you know, those things I was sharing with this woman, um, they offered her $40,000 to retire. She, she, didn't, she said she didn't know what she was going to do after, after she retired. And um, she said she, um, you know, her father had left her, just a whole bunch of things. She stopped going to church and everything like that. And I told her, I said, listen, I said, one thing that you know, that I know that if you pray and you see God concerning your answer, that he will give you an answer. I said, there will be a peace of God that will come upon you confirming your answer. I said, don't, don't go off of what I'm saying, but go off seeking his face and hearing from him. But long story short, you know, she made that decision and um, she, I believe she's gonna be retiring from the job and everything like that. But like I told her, it's the peace of God that we have and that's the benefit that we can share with one another. Yeah. I would say, um, I would share that you can live, you can, truly live, you know, your life um, when you're with God, because with him, you did truly discover who you are. And just knowing your purpose and why you're here is, I mean, words cannot explain that. And with him, you know, he's always pursuing you and that love that he has for you, you know, for us is just, you know, unexplainable. You know, when Adam and Eve had messed up, you know, here comes God and he comes down and he's walking through the garden. He's like, where you at? Where, where, where you at? You know, and they're just hiding from him, but he's still searching them out, even though they messed up. And that's the way God is with us. He's searching us out. He's still, you know, pursuing us. And who doesn't like to be pursued? Who doesn't like to be wooed, you know, um, in that? And so just living um, the best, you know, most people say, oh, I'm gonna wait till I get this age and I'm gonna truly live. No, live now. Live now. You can live your best now you know, on earth, right, as it is in heaven. So there's no limit to God when you're living with him. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, one of the things that I love about the Lord is he's always um, correcting my doctrine. One of the things that a lot of people were preaching, and the Lord, show, and I can show you in scripture, is that we always equate eternal life to heaven. You know, you want eternal life. Eternal life is heaven. It's heaven. It's heaven. But the, Jesus gives us a definition of what eternal life is. And John chapter 17, he says, verse 2, As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life. So he's defining what eternal life is. Oh, this is so good. That they may know you the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent. So eternal life is knowing the Father and knowing the Son. So when you always are trying to, see, that's why if you put eternal life as heaven, as a destination, you're working to get there. But when you realize eternal life is in knowing, and the word to know means to be intimate with. So eternal life is not in a place. Eternal life is in intimacy with Jesus. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit shall come and convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That word convict is to refute. 
In other words, the Holy Spirit came to refute, to go against what you believe those three concepts were. And the concept of righteousness is, is that Jesus would go to the Father. That's what he says righteousness is. So in other words, righteousness is the relationship between the Father and the Son. In other words, I have righteousness because I'm in Christ Jesus and he's next to the Father. So he wants me to partake of the conversation of the intimacy that he has with the Father. That's why he says, you're not servants, you're friends, because everything I have learned from the Father, I now teach you. So my righteousness, my eternal life is in knowing the Father and the Son. It's bringing me into the relationship between the Father and the Son. That's eternal life. It's not heaven, doc. It's not heaven. <laughs> It's no one can. You know, for some of us, you know, when you first get saved, you know, some people got saved. It's like, I was just trying to escape hell, you know. <laughs> that was just some people's testimony. It's like, I ain't know nothing else about God, but if I accept him, I ain't going to burn forever, <laughs> you know. And that might be just where you were, but then there's a place as you begin to grow in your relationship with God that you begin to recognize, like David is saying, that he becomes the prize, that he becomes the reward. And just having him, knowing him, doing life with him, like, he is all you want. <laughs> like, he's so good. He's so loving, like they talked about. It's so much benefits that just come just from being in relationship with him. Like, he don't have to give me another blessing. He don't have to do nothing else for me. But just being able to be near him is, a, is, a, is, is so good. Being able to hear him speak to me, I'm so happy. Like, feeling his love for me every day, like, that's prize enough for me. And there's, a, you know, the more you spend time with God, you get to realize just how good he is and just why people want him. <laughs> He's like, you know, you see people crying out to God and weeping on the floor and dancing. It's like, they just seem like they're just doing the most. So they just be extra, but you don't know what they are after with God. You don't know what God is saying to them, what he has done in their life, how he has changed them. And when God is your prize, you are willing to make a fool of yourself before people Jesus. because you're so in love with him that nothing else matters. Yeah. And here is what God wants us to realize. It's so good to do life with him. So I want you to say this, say, my life, my life is, better is better with God. Life is, life is better, with God. better with God. So I want you to take a few moments to make it really personal to you. Like, how has your life been made better since choosing God? You know, think about that for yourself. We all know where we've been <laughs> or where we could have been. But how has your life been made better since choosing him? And when you have those things, there's something worth thanking him for. You know, in God is literally everything we could ever long for in life. Anything that we could ever desire, pursue, that everything is found in him. There's nothing outside of God that is worth going after. That any joy, any peace, like life, like she said, <laughs> any blessings, anything there is to enjoy in life, it, everything is found in God. And so when I partner with him, when I do life with God, when I'm allowing him to be a part of my life that I get to experience all good things. <laughs> the scriptures talks about how God will hold no good thing from us, that he wants to give us all good things. So this scripture, I'm going to read this Romans chapter 5 in verse 10 through 11. It says, for since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, it says, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. In verse 11, so now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. <laughs> look, we have been made friends with God. It says, look, there was a time we were enemies of God. Like, our lives were living, like, spitting in his face, like, the way we was choosing to do life. But then it says, because of Jesus, when we accept his free gift of salvation, it totally cleanses us, washes us of all our sins, and then we step into this place of actually being friends of God. 
And friendship with God is not just a one-time decision. It's a daily choosing him. That every single day I'm choosing to be your friend. You know, I don't know what, what life would be like is if you chose to marry somebody one day and you, you spent that wedding day of dedicating your life to that person and then you never talk to them again. <laughs> you never spent time together. It's like, what, what was the point of this? <laughs> you know, and for some people, you know, you gave your life to the Lord. You came down to the altar. You, you rededicated your life. You, 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 and you went home and you completely ignored him. <laughs> He's just, he just standing by your bed every day like, hey, <laughs> you know, what your attention and ready to do life if you were here is with God. We're friends of God, but we have to choose him every day. Every single day I'm choosing to think of him. I'm choosing to consider him. I'm choosing to invite him to be a part of my life. And when you do that, the things we talked about, that limitless power is made available to you, that we would do those greater things that we have not even seen. It says, I have not seen, ear have not heard the things that God has prepared for you. And I look, there are things that God has prepared for us that we haven't seen yet. And so don't lose your hunger. Don't assume you know all there is to know about doing life with God. Like, I've been a Christian for 25 years now, and I know what it means. No, there's more. <laughs> like, I've been a Christian for the last 50 years. And like, no, there's more. Like, there's always more to God than what we could ever imagine or what we could fathom. And so in this place of friendship with God, in this place of doing life with him, we get to pull out those things God has dreamed of coming to pass, and we get to then release them in this earth. Look, last scripture, Matthew 19, verse 26, says this, that with God, all things are possible. And so when I do life with God, there is nothing that is left untouched. All things are possible. You know, because there's a lot of times situations arise in our life, and it seems impossible. <laughs> like, I'm not going to get that job. Like, or, you know, I don't, there's no cure for this. Like, things seem completely impossible what, with God. All things are possible. And so when I choose to do life with God, I become completely limitless. Mm. Jesus. Like people did crazy things in scripture. They was translating places. They was running up balls. They was disappearing and popping up other places. Look, there's limitless things that God wants to do in our lives that we haven't even imagined or dreamed of. But who is hungry to see those things in their lives? Jesus. I know I am. <laughs> like, I don't want to be normal. <laughs> I want to know what it really looks like to have God living and breathing, moving on the inside of me, and what that really enabled me to do. And so when I enter into this place of friendship with God, I begin to see those things come to pass. And so let's just make this confession again, say, life is, life is better, with God. better with God. My life is, My life is better, with God. better with God. It's so good. So, so good. And so I know we got to get ready to wrap it up, but I don't know if there's any last closing remarks any of you wanted to share. <laughs> I um, had this picture uh, while you were, were talking um, that this, this God, just, he desires this intimacy with us. And um, those of us, you know, that is married or relationships or whatever, can you imagine, you know, like Mr. Antoinette was saying that if you got married and then you never came back and talked, you know, and God is like, you know, come talk to me. I want to talk to you. I want to share with you. I want to commune with you. And it's, and I just seen this picture, like him just calling out to his people and him waiting for us to come to him, to just commune with him. And when you don't come, that sadness that, that, that's there because he wants to speak to his son. He wants to speak to his daughter. And he's just waiting. He's calling and he's waiting for us to just be in this intimate place with him so he can just share his heart and reveal himself unto us. But we have to go talk to him. We have to say, okay, daddy, I'm ready. I'm sitting here listening. Can you imagine as a child when your dad left for work and you're sitting there waiting for him at the window for him to come back? And then when you see him, it's like, ah, oh, you know, you made it back. And then you're telling him about your day. And that's the way the father wants us to be with him. Yeah. So I just encourage you just to be in a place where you just desire God the most because it's so much better with him.
It's so true. It's so much better. This one lady shared a testimony of, you know, when she was just growing in a relationship with God, and she's like, I don't really know what to do when I spend time with him. Like, what do I say? And what do I do? And she had a young child, and he just ran in the room. He's just like, hi, mom. And just like sat on the bed. And God began to say to her, mom, that's how I want you to be with me. Just come before me, just as simply as you know how. Like God is not looking for you to be anything or do anything, like a put on the show. That he just wants you. <laughs> he just wants your attention to spend time with you so you could just sit in your bed as you're driving to work. Hey, God, <laughs> like what's up? <laughs> like just the fact that you would even look his way, he's so excited. Like God is so thrilled to, that you would pay him attention, that you would want to hear what he has to say, that you would even want to do life with him or even consider him in what you're doing, like he's so excited and so thrilled about that. And so anytime you just look his way, just simply giving him your attention, whether it's reading your word or actually just talking to him, maybe listening to some worship music, spending time singing to him, like whatever way you wanna offer yourself to him, he's so thankful and he's so grateful. And he literally waits for those moments every day of your life. He looks forward to the times that you would just sit with him, just be with him. That he doesn't want it just to be only when you come to church, but when you're at home and when you're washing the dishes and when you're at work and you daydream, but that you would just think of him. And so I would pray that would be our testimony for each and every one of us here tonight, that you would be encouraged throughout this week to just to pay God attention, <laughs> to invite him to do life with you in whatever way that looks like. So if you would, can we just, just stand at our feet tonight? Can we give a, a round of applause to our group discussion team? I thank you so much. <laughs> Y'all <Y> <laughs> get some good nuggets, yes. <laughs> some good words of wisdom. And so let's just turn our attention to God. God, we just thank you so much just for the things that we heard shared tonight. God, we thank you just for this wonderful and beautiful invitation to do life with you, God. And I thank you that for not one person in this room would leave and not experience the benefits of doing life with you, God. I think that you're increasing our awareness of your presence, God. Increase our awareness of what those things you would say to us. Thank you that you're giving us crystal clear hearing, to hear from you, God, to see, and from your perspective, to see things from your point of view, God. And we just thank you, God, for just opening up these opportunities, God, of spending time with you that we hadn't experienced before, God. And we thank you just for the transformation that will take place not only in our own lives, but in those we come in contact with. And so, God, we just thank you. We have a great expectation of the joys and the fun that we will have and having you be a part of our lives. And that, God, thank you that it will not be a boring thing or a tedious thing. God, I thank you that you, we would experience the pleasures of really knowing who you are and just having you be a part of our lives. And so, God, we just thank you even for the benefits that we've already reaped thus far. God, we thank you for the peace that you've given us. We thank you for the joy. God, we thank you for the healings that have taken place. God, we thank you just for, just for settling us. God, we thank you for the favor. We thank you for the mercy. We thank you for so many things, God, that we have already just experienced as a result of just choosing you, God. And we thank you that we open up ourselves for more. We open up ourselves to experience more and more and more and more of you, God, that we say that it's not enough, <laughs> that we will never grow just complacent, God, in what we think we know and what we think we can have in you, God. But thank you that you would just cause our hunger to increase, God, cause our desires for you to grow, that even when we become weary and well-doing, God, thank you that you will fuel our hunger once again, God. That if we become bored in Christianity, God, thank you that you would cause us to be excited once again, God. Thank you that you would just cause a newfound joy and a refreshing to come to each and every person that is here, God. That life with you would be so good that it would cause those around us to be so drawn to you because we're just enjoying you so much that other people want to know who you are. They want to experience you, God. They want to know this God that we know and that they'll be drawn into this life with you, God. And so we just declare, God, that we are continuing to reap the benefits every single day of our life that we're looking for daily blessings, God, that you're unloading to us. And we thank you, God. <laughs> 
that we will be just like children. We will come before you with no ulterior motives, no plans, no agendas, that we will be so free, <laughs> even with our mistakes, even with our flaws, God, that you see them all and you still love us. You still want us. And we just thank you for your forgiveness, God. We thank you for being a father to us. We thank you for being a friend to us. We thank you for being a partner to us, God. We thank you, God. And we bless your name for it. Soba, show me ele bekia. Mamri ele baso kura mandi ele bekia. Mandi ele baso kura ma. I'm telling you, there's going to be a strength that comes to you. <laughs> I just feel that in the spirit. <laughs> It's a newfound strength. Thank you, Jesus. So good. 